Good evening. I'd like to, there's so many of you here in the audience that I've known all of my life. You know, this is very daunting to come home to one's country and have to sort of speak. So I'm feeling very anxious um, about uh, this evening. Uh, first of all though, and there are lots of Larrakia people, once again, people I've grown up with and known all my life. Um, you know, the Quolls, the Fijos, there's a whole lot of people here. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge and pay respects to the Larrakia people, the, tradi the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet today, and pay my respects to their ancestors, past, present, and indeed, even into the future. There are heaps of um, Gurindji people here who I've also grown up with, the McGuinnesses, the Cusacks, a whole lot of people here as well, and other people like um, Tom Kelmer, whose family used to live at um, Kamali Creek. Um, so this, this is uh, like old home week. And of course, uh, Mary Ann and the Adams family, lots of prep camp families here, and I'm gonna talk about a prep camp a little bit today. So, and also I'd like to acknowledge um, the, the university, or not acknowledge them, but thank them for giving me the honour uh, to deliver this amazing lecture that they do every year. I feel very honoured and privileged to have been invited um, to deliver this um, today. So it just adds to my burden of distress. Um, <laughs> I'd really like to uh, also uh, acknowledge Wendy, Wendy Ludwig, um, who I think might have planted the idea here that I might be uh, someone that the university should consider. So thank you, Wendy, uh, for, uh, for putting me forward. But tonight, however, we are here to honour the memory of Vincent Lingiari and his leadership in the 1966 Wave Hill strike. I'll return to the story and to the, and to the place of the Gurindji in the contemporary struggle for the rights of Australia's First Peoples shortly. But first, I'd like to share another story with you, a personal story. This story is from the 1950s, a decade before the Wave Hill walk-off, and it is set at Prep Camp, a few miles from here in a suburb now called Stewart Park, where I and my sisters grew up with our mum and dad and many Prep Camp people here as well. For those who don't know the history, Prep Camp was home to many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families in those harsh post-war years. Many of those families had a stolen generation heritage with the parents of prep camp families having grown up in the nearby Carlin compound. Kids rounded up from all over the Northern Territory and incarcerated here in Darwin. My mother and many mothers here was one of those taken as a young girl sometime in the 1930s by white men on horseback, former Aliara family northeast of Alice Springs. She was brought here to the compound, 15 hundred kilometres away. After growing up at Carlin, she was sent to work as a young teenager on a farm on the other side of the Darwin Harbour near Balluan. Later, she met my dad, a Swedish merchant seaman who had jumped ship in Fremantle and made his way to Darwin. They married and settled at prep camp. My story is from when I was about nine, ten years old, when I was in grade three or four. All, uh, like almost all children from prep camp, I and my sisters attended school, like you all did, without fail. School attendance in those days was non-negotiable. We all just went. Every year, the class would have a Christmas party and at the, at the end of the final term, and the idea was that all the kids would bring food or a plate from home. I was excited because I knew my mum made the best sponge cakes ever, great high fluffy things. I pictured myself taking one of these cakes into school. I was a bit vain and wanted to show off what a great cook my mum was. But when I asked her to make the cake, she flatly refused. No matter what I said, how I nagged her, she just said no. Finally, in frustration, I, one, I had one more attempt. I said, why won't you make one of your cakes and let me take it to school? She hesitated for a moment and then she said quietly, I don't like white people eating my food. <laughs> I knew immediately from the way she said it that not only was this the end of the argument, but also that she was telling me something more. I can still see and hear her face today. I haven't forgotten this. Although I, d I didn't understand how, at the time, 
but it was clearly important. And so I trudged off to the Christmas party with a packet of store-bought Arnott's biscuits while all the other kids bought scones, cakes, biscuits baked by their mothers, none of which, I might add, were as good as my, my mum could have made. Now, this sounds like an ordinary domestic family event, and of course it is. But, like so many stories that are part of every Aboriginal family in this country, there's a lot packed into this little scenario. For a start, how did my mum get to be so good a cook? I see now that her skill with cooking was something she had learned from the white women she worked for as domestic unpaid labour. Her ability to cook a beautiful sponge cake was a direct consequence of the policy of assimilation by which all Australian governments aimed to eradicate us as distinct cultural groups. At the same time, there were other skills that were withheld from her and so many other stolen generations of people. Most importantly, growing up in Carlin Compound, she was never taught to read and write. Despite the rhetoric about Aboriginal children being taken away to improve their chances in life, literacy was one skill that the administration clearly thought was of no use to a young Aboriginal woman. That much is clear from our history. However, on a personal level, much about my mother's motivations in the story about the cake remains curious to me. Did she not want white people to eat her food as an act of defiance? Was it a reluctance or refusal to place herself in a situation of being judged by them? Was it her own brand of passive resistance? I don't know. However, I do know it was a profound moment in our relationship as she revealed something of herself to me. And as I said, this moment has stayed with me over all these years. And I believe this little incident points to the great gulf of experience between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Australia. It points towards an experience carried by so many of our families, the experience of having been treated unjustly, but of that injustice not being acknowledged. This experience has been analysed by Jill Storfer in her 2015 book entitled Ethical Loneliness, The Injustice of Not Being Heard. Stauffer describes a profound isolation and loneliness that arises as a consequence of such an experience, calling it ethical loneliness. She says that it is, and I quote, a condition undergone by persons who have been unjustly treated, who emerge from that injustice only to find that the surrounding world is not, will not listen to or cannot properly hear their testimony. Their testimony. Ethical loneliness is the experience of having been abandoned by humanity, compounded by the experience of not being heard. There is something of this ethical loneliness in my mother's experience and even in the story of the cake she would not make. I believe that experience is common to many, if not all, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families. It stems from the complex, often damaged and damaging relationship between First Nations and those who colonised this place from 1788 onwards. Much of that damage remains embedded in the relationship between black and white Australia. This nation has never properly dealt with that damage. It has never properly acknowledged it and acted upon that acknowledgement. I believe we are all now in, in 2017, all of us, all of us over 18, in fact this generation, have a historic opportunity to, to do that, to begin the process of repair to reset that relationship on a foundation of equality, justice and truth. That opportunity is presented by the prospect of genuine and substantive reform to the Australian Constitution. And that is the topic I want to talk to you about this evening. I'd like to take you on a journey that I have recently been on as a member of the Referendum Council, which was tasked with, the make, with making recommendations to the Federal Government on constitutional reform. I would like to share with you our experience of the unique regional dialogues with our First Nations peoples and communities around the country and what we heard, culminating in the National Convention of First Peoples at Uluru in May this year and the Uluru Statement from the Heart. And most importantly, I want to describe the three essential demands to come from this process, which I summarise in these three words, voice, treaty, truth. 
Before we trace that journey from the world of, the, of PrEP camp in the 1950s to where we stand today in 2017, I would like to acknowledge the importance of the Wavehill walk-off in 1966 in our history. Mr Lingiari and the other Gurindji men and women first walked off their jobs on the Wavehill station to demand fair pay and conditions, but ended up sitting down at Waddy Creek and demanding the return of their traditional lands. They were demanding proper acknowledgement of the injustice done to them and proper restitution of the harms done. In doing so, they began the modern land rights movement, the Yon Age land right movements, but they were also reasserting the struggle for self-determination as summed up so elegantly by Mr Lingiari himself when he said, we want to live on our own land, our way. In those nine words, he captured the essence of what has been and continues to be the central demands of our First Nations since almost 1788. First, recognition of our sovereignty, never ceded of the land of the country. Second, acceptance of our right to continue in our own unique and diverse cultures. The Gorinji and Mr Lingyari powerfully reasserted those demands, just as our First Nations have done since the beginning of the colonisation of Australia, and just as we continue to do so now. This year, 2017, is the year of anniversaries of events which built upon and extended the rights of First Peoples, as so clearly stated by the Gurindji. Um, today, this is just some of the anniversaries this year. 50 years since the 1967 referendum, 25 years since the Mabo decision overturned the lie of Terra Nullius in 1992, and 20 years since the Bringing Them Home report in 1967. It is also, crucially, 10 years since the intervention was unleashed on our communities here in the Northern Territory. The intervention was a counter-revolution, the attempt to turn back the clock to the times before the Gurindji and Wave Hill and the 1967 referendum and all the other achievements. The intervention was the attempt to take us back to the world of Prap Camp in the 1950s when the powers of the nation state reached into every aspect of how we lived our lives. Now, 10 years on, it is clear how profoundly and utterly the intervention and the thinking behind it has failed. It continues, however, to create much heartache and pain. As John Lawrence in his recent Castan Centre address has stated, 10 years on, the Northern Territory jails more people per capita than any other country in the world. The overwhelming majority of those incarcerated are Aboriginal. The number of children being removed from their families is soaring. It rose to, by an average of 16% per year between 2011 and 2015. This frightening increase is entirely due to the removal of Aboriginal children from their families. Family violence is out of control. These figures, which many of you know well, are profoundly disturbing. And there's many more, of course. But what they do is that they demonstrate the tsunami of anger, frustration, despair and sadness that is engulfing our communities and our families. These types of figures are echoed across the country. They reflect the kind of intervention thinking that has informed policy making over the last 10 years, based on the idea that the nation state knows what is best for us. Let us remember that the intervention was trumpeted by all instigators as necessary to protect Aboriginal women and children. It marked a shift in policy making, not just here, but across the country. Intervention thinking sees self-determination as a failed idea and blames us for the situation in which we find ourselves. It believes that we, we do not have anything to offer, that we are at best risks to be managed. It ignores or condones or covers up the abuse of young people in detention or our lack of housing or access to education, all the story, you know that. And I say again, it has utterly failed. We can see this through the, statistics, through the statistics, but more importantly, through visiting many of our communities and listening to the experience of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples over these last few months. I've been working in this field most of my adult life and I can honestly say that I've never seen things so bad. And this, is ha this has to change. 
We now sit in 2017 at what I believe is a critical juncture in our history, not just for the First Nations, not just for us, but of, the, of this country, but for the, whole, but, but for the, whole, of the whole of the nation state. Six weeks ago, the Referendum Council, of which I was co-chair, handed a report to the Prime Minister recommending what constitutional change should look like if it is to be acceptable to our First Peoples. The report documents what we were told in a series of regional dialogues with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and communities across the country. Going out and talking to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people was our first priority under our terms of reference. It was a cross-section of people we spoke to. We didn't go out and speak to every, per every one of the 700,000 plus Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, but it was a diverse collection of people from across the country, rural, remote and city. These 12 regional dialogues were held from Thursday Island to Hobart, from Perth to Ross River, outside of Alice Springs, to Sydney and Melbourne. And people came from the regions to those particular centres. We also held a one-day information set, uh, session in Canberra. Each dialogue was attended by around 100 people, including traditional owners, representatives of local organisations and other individuals. Each was held over three days to allow full consideration of a number of proposals for constitutional reform. It was the same agenda, same format, same time, all across the country. And we needed to have, um, have that kind of process. It was a deliberative process. But so as we could measure in some way, almost empirically measure what people were, t were, were telling us. That was really important. The reforms that each dialogue considered had been inherited by the Referendum Council from the work of the expert panel on the recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in the Constitution, co-chaired by now Senator Patrick Dodson, he wasn't then, and Mark Liebler, co-chair with me on, this, uh, on the Referendum Council, and the Joint Select Committee on Constitutional Recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, co-chaired by Senators Ken White and our own Nova Paris. These were... First, a statement, of, a statement acknowledging us as the first Australians or first peoples, either inside or outside the Constitution. Second, amending or deleting that part of the Constitution which empowers the Commonwealth to make laws for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Third, inserting a guarantee against racial discrimination into the Constitution. And fourth, deleting that part of the Constitution which contemplates the possibility of a state government excluding some Australians from voting on the basis of their race. The dialogues also considered a fifth option, and that of a First People's voice to be heard by Parliament and the right to be consulted on legislation policies that affect us. The dialogue process was unprecedented in Australia's history. Never before have we as First Nations sat down across the country in such an intensive, structured manner to deliberate on constitutional matters, and it was a passionate process. Delegates grappled with the technical and legal implications of these proposals, as well as with their political viability. There were disagreements, there were even arguments. How could it be otherwise when 1,200 people from all the diversity of our nations were brought together to talk about matters so closely connected with the experiences and history of their families, clans and communities? But there was also an extraordinary level of agreement on some matters. When delegates from the dialogues assembled at Uluru in May this year, the exhaustive deliberations and informed participation through the regional dialogues led to a broad consensus as articulated in the Uluru Statement from the Heart, which was adopted by the Convention. Specifically, Australia's First Peoples overwhelmingly rejected any purely symbolic changes to the constitu Constitution, such as through a statement of recognition. There were two reasons behind the rejection of this narrow model of constitutional recognition. First, there was a concern that formal recognition in the Constitution might interfere or say something about our sovereignty and all dialogues were steadfast in asserting the fact that we as First Nations had never ever ceded our sovereignty. In reasserting the fact of sovereignty, the delegates echoed the conclusions of the expert panel on constitutional recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples five years ago, which stated that, and I'm quoting, the occupation of the country proceeded on the fiction of terra nullius 
It follows that ultimately the basis of settlement in Australia is, and always has been, the exertion of force by and on behalf of the British Crown. No one asked permission to settle, no one consented, no one ceded. Sovereignty was not passed from the Aboriginal peoples by any actions of legal significance voluntarily, ta voluntarily taken by or on behalf of them." Unquote. Second, and the more simply, and more simply, participants at the dialogues and at Uluru simply did not trust the likely process for drafting a constitutional statement of recognition. The concern was that by the time the lawyers were through with it, such a statement would end up being so bland as to be incompatible with the duty to recognise the difficult truths of Australia's past. Instead, our mob wanted substantive change, structural reform for their communities on the ground. And if it didn't fit that criteria, they weren't interested. And this is where dialogue participants and the Uluru Convention showed significant agreement. There was overwhelming consensus around three proposals. First, for a constitutionally established representative body that would give First Nations a voice directly to the federal parliament. Second, for the establishment of a Makarata Commission to supervise the making of treaties with us. Third, for a process of local and regional truth-telling which could form the basis for genuine reconciliation. These three things, voice, treaty, truth, were the key consensus demands that arose from the dialogues and were captured in the Uluru Statement from the Heart and also form the core of the Referendum Council's report. I'd like to now turn to each of these three crucial concepts and unpack them, give you my view why they are important, what they might mean and how they might provide a pathway out of our current situation. This whole process was not an abstract notion or an intellectual construct. Changing the constitution, many of us believe, is the only place left for us to go. We are all sat on committees. We have set up our own organisations. We have changed national policy agendas, but still we haven't been able to achieve the substantive change demanded by our communities. Marcia Langton just said recently at Gama, she said that um, we're royal commissioned out we're panelled out, we're committee out, that's enough. We still have to rely on other people, we still rely on other people's goodwill and that's been the basis of the relationship and that's not good enough anymore and we need more than that. We need once and for all for our sovereignty to be recognised and our voices to be heard. The recommendation for substantive constitutional change was for the establishment of a representative body that gives Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander First Nations a voice to the Commonwealth Parliament. We believe, following the consensus at Uluru, that this is the only constitutional reform which would, afford, which would accord with the wishes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And why is this so important? Establishing such a body in the Constitution has both sub substantive and symbolic value. Symbolically, it recognises the, the unique place of First Peoples in Australian history and in contemporary Australian society. It formally acknowledges our place here. In asking Australians to vote yes to such a proposal, we will be asking us all to reflect on who we are, on what values and principles we hold dearest. It would establish a significant national narrative about working together, about a genuine two-way conversation. But such a body will also provide substantive benefits. A constitutionally entrenched voice to parliament could address Australia's poor history of consultation, or none at all, with our, with our First Peoples by governments. All too often we have been excluded from the key decisions that are made about our lives. The intervention itself is a key example, designed over three days in some offices in Canberra by people who took little account of the evidence, had no understanding of the realities of our lives here, and most significantly, didn't talk to any of us. They just did it. The voice to Parliament would ensure we have input at the highest level into the policy making that affects us. It could play a role, it could play a valuable monitoring role. Properly resourced, it could hold government to account 
regularly reviewing and reporting on the implementation of recommendations from the host of inquiries and reports from the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody right up to now and beyond. It could also monitor the use of the Constitution's race power or attempts to suspend racial discrimination legislation as they did here so that measures like the intervention could be properly scrutinised before, before their implementation. Embedding the establishment of a voice to the parliament in the constitution is vital because the body's existence would not then be at the whim of whichever government was in power in Canberra. And I know many of you here, I mean, every time there's a change, not only a change of government, but a head of a government department or a new minister, we have to all troop to Canberra and justify our existence over and over and over again. This body would be a permanent and enduring feature of the nation's body politic. It could only be abolished by going back to you, the people, in a new referendum. All of our, all of our organisations have disappeared over the years at the stroke of a minister's pen, as they did with ATSIC, and there was, we all know about ATSIC, but they were able, NAC, anything that we had, some minister would decide, no, I'm not gonna have that mob anymore, and sign a document, and then it's gone. This time they're gonna go to referendum, if we have it, if you vote yes. <clears throat> and finally, at last, we would we'd at last be in the main building, not in the demountable, somewhere out the back. Of course, the details of how to establish such a body would need to be carefully negotiated with Parliament once its establishment was agreed through referendum. My vision, and that of many people we spoke to during the dialogues and at Uluru, is for a body that would include representations from the, all the diversity of First Nations across Australia. Each of the First Nations, that would be the voice. It would be a place for dialogue, a meeting place for us and with us. And in my opinion, it is this diversity that would enrich the body politic. After 65,000 years or more on this continent, we all, with all our different languages, histories and cultures, I think we would have something powerful and unique to offer the nation state through such a body. Let me turn to the second proposal to come from the Dialogues and from Uluru Treaty. You know, Australia is one of the few liberal democracies in the world which still does not have a treaty or treaties or some kind of formal acknowledgement or arrangement with its Indigenous minorities. It is something we have demanded since at least the mid-19th century. Despite the hard-won gains, such as through the Land Rights Act, following the Gurindji walk-off and the Native Title Act sparked by Neb Eddie Bar Marbo, there is still unfinished business that we need to resolve. We use the word makarata to describe this process of agreement or treaty making. Makarata is the process that guides the Yulngu Nation of Northeast Arnhem Land through difficult disputes. And its workings have been recently described by Gullaroy Unipingu in this way, I quote, each party, led by their elders, must speak carefully and calmly about the dispute. They must put the facts on the table and air their grievances. The leaders must always seek a full understanding of the dispute. What lies behind it? Who is responsible? What each party wants? And all things that are normal to peacemaking efforts. When that understanding is arrived at, then a settlement can be agreed upon." Unquote. Following the Uluru Statement, this means the establishment of a Makarata Commission to set up a national framework and principles for negotiating treaties and maybe even a possible national document. A treaty is a pathway to the recognition of our sovereignty and to the achievement of self-determination. It is an agreement between equals, unknown concept in this country. Such treaties could be regional or statewide and it would be the Makaratas Commission's job to provide a national framework for and supervise these two-way processes. Critically, treaties are inseparable from the third demand from the Dialogues and, Ul and Uluru, truth. You cannot make a lasting and effective agreement unless you have a shared, truthful understanding of the nature of the dispute, of the history, and of how we got to where we stand. The true story of colonisation must be told, must be heard, must be acknowledged, because this is still not the case. This is probably difficult and painful ter territory for us as well as for mainstream Australia. And it can be hard to hear. 
As Jill Stauffer says in her book, Ethical Loneliness, that I quote her from at the beginning of tonight, I quote, Responding well to others, especially survivors of wrongdoing, may require that we open ourselves of hearing something other than what we expect or what we want to hear. But, here, unquote, but hearing this history is necessary before we can come to some true reconciliation, some genuine healing on both sides. I was reminded of this last month when I read media stories about an online digital map of more than 150 massacres developed by Professor Lindell Ryan at the University of Newcastle. Through meticulous ex examination of the records, the map seeks to provide the evidence for those who still question whether massacres happened. Professor Ryan has started documenting these facts for the eastern coast of Australia, but plans to extend this to the rest of the country. 150 so far. Now, this is important work, but I question how it is we have to wait until 2017 for this. Why is this not part of the national conversation? Why don't you all know it? Our communities know about the massacres. Our families know about the children being forcibly removed. And it seems, but it seems that there is a need for many in mainstream Australia to pretend that all this didn't happen and that it's all just part of the black armband uh, view of history made, made up to make you feel guilty. One of the most moving episodes in the regional dialogues for me personally came at Ross River near Alice Springs. There, the elders spoke of the distress they felt of the recent placement of a statue of the explorer John McDowell Stewart in Alice Springs to mark the 150th anniversary of his attempt to reach the top end from Adelaide. The statue was shown him holding a gun. The elders felt legitimately that this showed a painful lack of respect given the fact that Stewart's journey led directly to a series of massacres in the region as, as control of the land was wrested from the traditional owners. Family members still alive in Alice Springs and know these stories really well. But however, let me be clear, this process of truth-telling is not about guilt. You know, guilt is such a debilitating emotion and stops us from moving or it prevents us from doing anything. Oh my God, I feel so guilty. Uh, what I'm talking about is about respect and acknowledgement. As one participant at the regional dialogues in Broome said, we are people who worked as stockmen for no pay, who have survived a history of full of massacres and pain. We deserve respect, unquote. And of course, this is not just a history of, our, of First Peoples. It is a history of all of us, of all Australia, and we all need to own it. Then we can move forward together. The dialogues um, opted for the development of a declaration of recognition and this declaration be drafted and it sit outside the constitution. And it was free to, and so it would be free to articulate the difficult, this difficult shared history. It could provide a unifying statement about the three waves of people who make up the Australian story. Our ancient first peoples, us. 65,000 years plus. Those who came in 1788 and after, and those people who have come from out of Europe and Asia and who continue to try to come to us today, or try to, often fleeing persecution and seeking a better life. So there's three waves of people who make up Australian society today. So this is where we stand in, in 27, 2017. The unprecedented process of deliberation by Australia's First Peoples through the regional dialogues and at Uluru led to the formulation of three clear demands, voice, treaty, truth. Some commentators and others have expressed concern that these are new proposals, the examination of which will need yet more processes to consider. I respectfully disagree. None of these issues are new, in fact. We've been talking about these things for a long time. Other commentators believe that these are impractical left-field proposals. Again, I respectfully disagree. I believe these changes are challenging but achievable and are proportionate to the level of distress, anger and powerlessness being felt by our communities. You know, in the, in the international landscape, what we're asking for is in fact modest, even conservative. 
it's nothing compared to what happens in other colonised countries around the world of this uh, status. Many of our First Nation and Nations communities and families are plagued by a myriad of challenges, including poverty, suicide, youth detention, family breakdown, and all kinds of health problems. But worse, in my view, than any of this is that too many of us feel hopeless. To reverse this and to take our rightful place in this country, we need to create new places, new ways by which we can speak and get things done to deal with our complicated 21st century lives. At the same time, we will strongly and even fiercely guard who we are and our right to be different. We need to create a future where we and our children and our grandchildren are recognised as having something powerful and unique to offer this nation. And this needs to happen now, and not just for us as First Nations. This is about the social and emotional well-being of the country as a whole. It is a time of reflection, a time for all Australians to consider what kind of society we are today, what are our values and our principles. Surely we're not the same people as we were in 1901 when the Constitution was drawn up. Surely not. Eventually, we will have to sit down together, black and white, in this nation and deal with this, deal with this relationship, deal with this history. For the, for the truth is that this, after all, this really is our place. We, the First Nations, we're not going anywhere. They, the politicians, I suspect, can put it off for another 10 years, 20 years, 50 years. But eventually, you will have to sit down with us as respectful equals and sort out this relationship. But right now, we have an opportunity, a roadmap for doing that. Simply this, voice, treaty, truth. And I want to add justice. Hear us, acknowledge us. Thank you for coming.